So what do we start off with? Um, the, the name of the chapter. There are two names of the chapter. Now this chapter is called electrochemistry and also called redox chemistry. So it's redox and electrochemistry. Because electrochemistry means transfer of electrons. And transfer of electrons implies that they are redox reactions. Now, the one basic idea that you should know is that chemical reactions generally have energy exchanges. And so, so most chemical reactions will have an energy exchange. They'll either give it out or take it in. The way this works is that most of the time, energy of a reaction is given out as heat. And we study that using enthalpy changes. Now, sometimes in redox reactions, you can actually uh, also give out electrical energy. So, we are, so what we're going to do is we're going to focus this chapter on basically the the, the the output of such energy in terms of electrical energy. Now, you know and you've come across this that you know, just like you, some reactions provide heat while others require you to give heat for it to happen, like endothermic reactions, thermal decomposition reactions. You've also seen reactions where, this, where there are reactions are forced by providing electricity. You have seen things like electrolysis, electrolysis in IGCSE or O levels. Now, in all levels, you do electrolysis. What happens in electrolysis? Electrolysis is what? It's basically uh, using electricity to force chemical reactions. Now, since you guys have done entropy, do you guys remember entropy? There were those reactions that were spontaneous, and there are those reactions that are non spontaneous. Now, electro electrolysis helps you also conduct those reactions that are non-spontaneous by providing certain amounts of electrical energy. So uh, that's that's a, that's so. This chapter is somewhat related to energy entropy, all that in the in terms of an idea. But obviously, uh, chemical reactions can be of multiple types. Electrical energy can only be given out for certain redox reactions. It won't be possible for other reactions that are not redox. So I'm going to start off with something you know and then work towards something basically on a new idea. Now, in uh, O-levels, you must have heard of a very, very common reaction used in and talked about in uh, lab theory, uh, ATPs, that, you know, and even in metal reactivities, knowing that zinc is more reactive than copper, and you guys do reactivity series, you should also know another name for reactivity series is redox series, or reduction series, or electrochemical series. Because reactivity of metals is about them acting as reducing agents to become uh, oxidized. And one very common reaction to talk about was where zinc metal, which is more reactive than copper, is used to displace copper. You would call this reaction a displacement reaction, but this reaction is also a redox reaction. And this is the reaction I'm concerned with right now because I'm going to use this reaction to explain this chapter is all about. Because you've used this reaction and you've used the idea of learning a whole... Uh, what you call it, reactivity series to know which metal will displace what. Because if I had, if I know that I give this to you, you'll know that what will happen. You know that zinc will become zinc sulfate and copper will be given off. On the other hand, if I had told you that here I give you copper and I give you, let's say, another sulfate, let's say iron sulfate, what reaction would take place? And you'd say there'll be no reaction. And the reason why you'd say there'll be no reaction is because copper is less reactive than iron. And you've learned that. You have to have, you've had to learn that in O levels. At this point, are you guys remembering this? Yeah, po so da 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 that stuff, that stuff. So, yeah, you guys give me one second, if you guys can. Okay. So the idea is that, huh? So you know this reaction won't take place. But I want to focus so that you had learned this. So one of the purposes of this reaction is KR, in the end, you never have to learn this. We can predict all redox reactions, but it starts off from this very popular one. 
this fellow, the zinc copper sulfate. I want to focus on that guy. So if I focus on that guy, the ionic equation for that reaction, the reason why I'm saying ionic is because sulfate is doing jack, like most of you in class. Zinc, therefore... I know. Sorry about that, boys and boys. So zinc reacts with copper to form zinc ions in copper. This is what's happening. And what's happening is that zinc is going from an oxidation state of zero to an oxidation state of plus two, and copper is going from plus two to zero. And if you actually extract the half equations for this, zinc is becoming zinc two plus, and copper two plus is becoming copper. And the only way this could have happened was if zinc was losing electrons and copper was gaining electrons, which tells me that zinc was being oxidized and copper was being reduced. And you call the above reaction redox because redox may one guy gets oxidized and the other guy gets reduced. And this happens together. But what's really happening is zinc is losing electrons and they travel from zinc to copper. So they have to touch each other and zinc hands off its electron. Each atom of zinc hands off two electrons to each at ion of copper. That's what's really literally happening. You know? So at the atomic level, one each atom of zinc, one zinc atom loses two electrons and they are accepted by each ion of copper. That's what's happening at the very atomic level. And zinc, and the reason why we know is because zinc is more reactive and copper is less reactive. And so we've already done that stuff, right? Now, what we want to achieve is, we want to do this is that, KR, what if I tell you that I want to be able to see this electron transfer? You see, because we have seen electrons move, we call them current through wires, right? So I want to be able to witness to see this fellow giving electrons to this fellow. And one idea that comes to mind is, I keep, I don't let them touch each other. I make sure that these electrons are passed through a wire to these ones. So like for example, these are passed through a wire to copper solution. So what I think about the most obvious thing I'll, I'll try to do is this. And let me just, yeah. So what I'll try to do is I'll take a beaker, which if I can draw it very well. Yeah. So I, what I'll do is I'll take a beaker and I'll obviously use blue for that beaker. Yeah. Okay, it's not happening for that shape. Okay. Sorry. So I'll take... Uh, and in this case, I put, let's say, copper sulfate. Why would I... Or copper nitrate. Any of the two. I put in a solution. I'll color it in fact with the highlighter. Let's say, blue is solution. Now, this solution that I have in here is... Let's say, copper sulfate. It's got copper aqueous ions. And it's got sulfate aqueous ions for now. And what I want to do is I'll say, you know what? I'll put in a wire here because I've got my zinc. And generally speaking, if we have a zinc rod, you know, we tend to, dis if, if this is a zinc rod, what we do is normally we'll take the zinc rod into this beaker and you would see that after some time the zinc starts to dissolve and the solution becomes colorless and copper starts to deposit separately. Now, what I want to do is, I want to be able to do this separately. Like I want to not have these two meet. This being zinc, metal. So one way is, let's put a wire here. Now, what I'm trying to do is, I'm trying to facilitate, I still want the zinc to lose electrons to copper, but I want to be able to see the electrons move. And to show electrons normally, what do we do? In O levels or in basic terms, may, what would you like to do? We generally like to put a bulb somewhere, you know? So what we'll do is, like, you know what? Let's put a bulb here. I don't know how you make a bulb, but you get the idea, right? So in, in circuit diagrams, I think this is how you put a bulb. So you put a bulb there, 
and why would I put a bulb? Because if I can, if electrons will go through this wire, this bulb will light up, right? Now, I've got zinc here, separate. I've got copper solution here. And once I connect this, these electrons may, these, uh, these ions, uh, these, uh, sorry, zinc will want to push the electrons this way. But if zinc wants to push the electrons this way, zinc has to become what? If you remember, zinc had to become zinc 2 plus ions. Now this can happen on its own. That becomes a problem. So what we do is, we then say, okay, we want zinc ions. Because, I, because the purpose was to make sure that the electron transfer from zinc to copper happens through this wire. So what I do is, I say, you know what? I will put zinc in an aqueous solution. Because how? Because there's no way you can put ions on a metal rod. The ions will have to become aqueous. So, I put this in a pani. But instead of putting this in pani, because pani doesn't facilitate a reaction, we put this in an already existing solution of zinc ion. So, we put this in a zinc aqueous form. So, what I'm doing is basically I'm block by block building a way where I can have Zinc react with what? Remember the main purpose was zinc reacting with copper ions to form zinc aqueous and copper. Now I normally I would just add them together. But I want to separate so I can measure. I cannot just see the current happening. I can also measure it. So if I have an ammeter, I can know the current passing. I can even time it how long that current passed. So I will be able to do a lot more calculations with that. I will be able to predict many things with that. So that's why we are doing this. Now. So far, what did we do? So far, we did was we put zinc in a solution of its ions. This zinc. So now, what do we have? Is we have this is still zinc. So we have zinc still here. So this metal is zinc. This is zinc aqueous ions, and then this guy produces zinc ions. So the zinc ions increase here. This could be a zinc, let's say, nitrate solution, but we don't care about the ion ion. But zinc forms here. So the zinc metal from this rod becomes a cosines here and the electrons then move this way. Now they can go here and come through the wire into the solution of copper. And when they come here, at this stage what happens is copper 2 plus aqueous in the solution gains those two electrons to become copper. And what we have done is, in fact, we have done, we call this an electrochemical cell. So just the same reaction, separated like this is an electrochemical cell. It's not fully a full cell yet, but this is what we want to build. And the, reason, and the reason for that is just to be able to isolate the electron transfer. The key is isolate. Once we can isolate it, we can do many things. If we can measure the intensity of the current, we know reactivity of metals, we know, we can predict reaction of metals, all that stuff. It is the most useful thing to be able to figure out ke ye current kitna hai, ya at least potential difference between these two uh, terminals kya hai. Because the potential difference is really the reactivity difference. Like in O levels, you definitely do this, ke the bigger the difference in the reactivity series may, positions may, the more potential will be, potential difference will be in a cell that they make. And that's what we want to use here. Now, before we continue, uh, some terms you need to know. This, what I just did on this left hand side, that I'm putting a dotted line. This, this section is called a half cell. And the reason why it's called a half cell, just like two half equations make one full equation, two half cells make one full cell. And the term cell ka kya technical matlab hai chemistry mein? The cell is basically any setup, any redox setup that produces electrical energy using a chemical reaction. So by putting them separate, since I was passing the current through a bulb, there was electrical energy and the bulb lit up. This proves that this was a cell. So that's why your batteries are actually called cells. Lithium ions, all these are cells because they produce electricity by a chemical reaction. The, you also need to know a few other terms. These cells are also called electrodes. 
Electrodes are what? Opposite ends in a, in a cell. Now, there are two types of electrodes you probably have heard of. You've heard of anodes and cathode. And the only way you should remember them is anode is the electrode where oxidation takes place and cathode is the electrode where reduction takes place. Because one thing I can be sure of in a redox reaction, if it's a redox reaction, there will be reduction and there will be oxidation. They might not, they might not always be cation, but there will always be oxidation and reduction. And so I've got two half cells here, here and here. Is me kya ho raha hai? Zinc is becoming iron. So this is oxidation. And the guy on the right is there for reduction. And the uh, electrode jahan oxidation hoti is called the anode. And where there's reduction, where that's called the cathode. Because what is oxidation? loss of electrons. What is reduction? Gain of electrons. And what you realize is that the electrons are always going to flow from the anode to the cathode. Because they'll go from reduction to oxidation. Sorry, they'll go from oxidation to reduction. All right. Any questions for this so far? Yeah, uh, so you have to put the zinc rod in solution. Like if you don't, doesn't the zinc metallic cells have electrons? Yeah, yeah. The no, so the electrons can never go in the solution. So you could have started with water. You could have just started with water also. That's possible. It'll just take a little longer, but you can, you can start with water. But the problem was not to do it once. See, I could have taken water to do this. But this gave the idea to scientists that, you know what? Why just do it for zinc copper? If I can find the potential difference, and they did. They put a voltmeter here. And they found that this was a potential difference of 1.10 volts, literally. So they said, saying, you know what? If you ever want to produce 1.10 volts, let's use a zinc copper cell. And the first cells, this is how we generated electricity. This was the most coolest thing that we did, was generate electricity from reactions. This is the advent of everything we know in terms of electronics. This was Michael Faraday's big moment. I think Faraday, tha, na? I'm not sure. But, uh, you know, my history sucks in science. Ha, huh, European history, pretty good at. For electromagnetic, electromagnetic. Wo bhi hai. Wo bhi hai. But his work is also in chemistry also because a hundred and some odd years ago, chemistry was physics really. All the people who come up with the basic atomic theory, which included uh, Neil Bohr, who corrected Einstein, by the way, Einstein was wrong about the atom. Uh, or as a group of scientists together as one group. But it was part of physics. So the same person, because this was part of physics, because chemistry at that time was thought about as magical, like just learn reactions. So once we started understanding the subatomic particles is when we started understanding chemistry. And subatomic particles like electrons were part of electricity, which was being studied by physicists. So physicists and chemists, or at least one guy doing both things was similar. But this was the idea that we had. But understand that we wanted to be able to formalize this and then be able to compare it. So, like I said, there were certain terms made. Like, so what you realize also is that, you know what, this is another metal here. If you think about this, this is a flawed diagram. There is a metal here in the wire. So the only way to not have any other element interfere, we thought, you know what, we have got zinc and solution here, here are copper ions, hain. so to make them equal half cells, because you see, what does this equation have? Metal and ion of zinc. What does this equation have? Metal and ion of zinc, copper. And this solution has copper. So they said, okay, to ensure the comparison is fair, let's put this metal as copper. So later on, they put this as a metal copper. Not a wire, but a metal. So this become a metal later for copper. So I got copper, metal, and copper ion in here. And that's why we put zinc ions here. Because what I'm giving you is not the first time they did it, but like once they've, they've understood this idea and they wanted to solidify it, they said, okay, so what we'll do is we'll make voltaic cells. Also, that was the old name, which is now the new name is in an electrochemical cell. And technically speaking, what is an electrochemical cell? One that produces, so basically it's, it's got to be two half cells connected first of all, and their function is 
they produce electricity or electrical energy or potential difference when connected why because as a redox reaction takes place when i calling it redox reaction you know that there is an electron transfer taking place now i'll go to the next page if you guys don't mind so now we go to formalizing into something that we can use again and again so the electrochemical cell is is made up of first of all half cells so let's talk about a half cell so what we did was we wanted to standardize everything so first of all a half cell was a metal in a solution of its ions since we saw zinc first i'll put that one up so this is a beaker of uh zinc solution so this got zinc 2 plus aqueous ions obviously you'll have to be an anion too with it like zinc nitrate or sulfate or something but we don't care about that we care about that at least zinc has me because you can't just put a cation in a solution a solution is made by putting a compound in and we put the metal in here so we have let's say a rod and this rod is zinc metal and this is called a half cell okay so a half cell is a metal in a solution of its ions so this is the first half cell theek hai zinc zinc you can imagine zinc metal and there is zinc nitrate here theek hai now on the uh, now this is a half cell now later on you realize that we don't just have half cells we like to have standard half cells so if you want to have standard half cells what makes them something standard that the concentration becomes 1 mole per dm cube so you start off with not just taking zinc nitrate of any concentration you want to make sure that this comes from 1 mole per dm cube zinc nitrate solution and so what you did was you actually and i will take this and uh, write this again copy and i take this down and paste this again right there Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I hope I'm yeah, making. Yes, please ask. Yeah, does uh, uh, yeah, does concentration affect potential difference, or is it unique yes, to every metal? Yes, it will affect every. Uh, the concentration will affect the potential difference. Yes, that's why we wanted to specify it because if it didn't, we would not bother with it. But it does, and we'll see very shortly because what you realize a little later, I'll talk, I'll talk about it, that how it affects it. So. first of all what we did was we took two half cells obviously copper is not white as a metal it's pink you right so let me get some pink ah huh? pink would help no not this pink so like orange pink let's do that so so i took copper metal here and this is let's say copper 2 plus aqueous so now what you had was on the left hand side is called a zinc zinc 2 plus half cell this is how we write it zinc zinc 2 plus half cell and the guy on the right was called a copper copper 2 plus half cell now you don't need to know this notation but just saying that this is the zinc half cell this is the copper half cell and what they did was they just connected it through instead of using a bulb they'll put a voltmeter because if, if, even if you put a bulb and a voltmeter the bulb will light up but the voltmeter will tell me the potential difference and this showed me the potential difference between the two was 1 volt and using an ammeter we knew that the electrons were because we did this experiment electrons were going from zinc to copper and remember electrons are negative so they'll always go from a negative terminal to a positive terminal but on the left hand side zinc 
was losing electrons to become zinc ions. So that was oxidation. And the right hand side was reduction because copper 2 plus was gaining the two electrons to become copper. So what we did, what we have done now is taken a very easy reaction, zinc becoming reacting with copper sulfate to really complicate it. It is complicated, I know, but there's a reason for this complication. This complication for an easy reaction is easier to understand than a complication for a harder reaction. And once you get the easier reactions, what we realize is that we are creating a standard way of drawing this out. So we got a half cell here with the metal and a solution of its ions, a half cell here, and you connect the two half cells, you get a full cell. Now, because it's a cell, you're going to generate electricity. And electrons will transfer from one to the other. They'll transfer from the guy getting oxidized to the guy getting reduced. And these are two half equations. And if you add them up, you get the full equation. So a lot of things happening in one diagram, I admit. But that's the fun bit. And the reason why electrons went this way were from our earlier knowledge of O levels, that we knew between zinc and copper, zinc was more reactive, which meant that zinc had a greater tendency to lose electrons than copper. So hence electrons were lost from zinc and they were forced onto copper. And what would happen is zinc metal here, will this zinc metal over time will start to form ions. Matlab, if you ran this for a while, these metal will decrease in size because it'll keep becoming ions. And on the right hand side, the copper from the solution will start to deposit on this copper. And this copper will increase in mass. And, you'll, and eventually you'll run out of either this or the copper, copper solution. You would. But this is what we call a, a full cell. Uh, is missing hai, which I'm going to add just to add it, but I would rather you not ask me about it yet. I'll talk about it in a bit. To finish this cell, we had to have another connection made. Okay, not this. And that connection was called a salt bridge. Basically, if you only think of charges, it's just the wire goes back to make a whole loop. But it's not really that. It's more technical than that. But without it, there's no circuit completion. But for now, for the next one class, or for next bit, ignore this function. Just know that it exists. But this whole thing is an elect electrochemical cell, and these of them are half cells. And the overall charge is the, overall potential difference is the current. Now, the overall potential difference is basically caused by zinc tending to become copper. Now at this point, understand that before adding these, like this is a whole cell. If I go back to my idea of half cell for a second, now that was what? I'll put my half cell back again. Remember this half cell? So the moment I put zinc in a solution of its ions, before I even connect the cell, this is the half cell, I need you to know what's happening. The moment I do that, zinc metal starts to become zinc ions. But the zinc ions all form the solution, because once it starts to do that, what happens is that if I were to focus here and I will delete the water, ka, this solution, so I can talk about it. So there is obviously a liquid here, but I can't draw it right now. So if zinc atoms from this rod start to become ions, what happens is the, the electrons can never go into solution. The electrons can only be delocalized. So the electrons stay on the metal like this, on the metal itself. And the solution gets extra zinc ions. Because it already had zinc ions, but it gets more. But because it gets more zinc ions and there are electrons here, after some time, the solution ke ions also say that, hey, I can also accept those electrons to become zinc metal. And so you realize that the same reaction is happening backwards. And at, after some time, the equal, uh, this rate slows down and this rate for this 
starts to uh, rise and eventually this becomes an equilibrium that zinc ions and zinc become an equilibrium you can light the equilibrium like this or you could have written the equilibrium like this zinc ions the thing with that is that both are the equilibriums and the reason why because this slows down this increases then they are becoming equal at some point and they become an equilibrium because once they become equal there is no net change you can write the equilibrium either or way but the way i've written at the bottom sorry about that guys the way i've written here that's our standard way of writing it because standard reduction likhte hain hum the forward reduction is what we show and the backward is oxidation this is our way of writing it and this happened with copper sorry with zinc also and copper also so my point being that whenever you have half cells and let's just talk about the half cells we have right now which did we have we had i'll make both of them and i'll wrap this up at that point is that we had one with zinc metal sorry and i know it's repetitive but the reason why it's repetitive is because i it every time i repeat it i'm going to add one point more so that it solidifies with you this is zinc iron and this is zinc metal and at this point this is a half cell and every half cell has an accompanying equation in which it's in the aqueous ions are in equilibrium with the metal sorry about that you think on the right hand side i would just have copper and this is the copper half cell and i'd have copper 2 plus aqueous here which would happen to be a blue solution and zinc wali would be colorless so let's just like that both of them have their own equilibria the copper one would be copper 2 plus plus 2e becoming an equilibrium because the idea is that both the iron and the metal have to be in equilibrium and we tend to write it in direction direction of reduction first but you could have written either or and when is when they're in equilibrium that you should also already realize at that point of equilibrium there are certain electrons on the rods for both of them but since we know that when we had connected this electrons really were moving from zinc to copper remember that i told you we know that it does which implies that there were more electrons on zinc than they were on copper because electrons like pressure will go from an area of higher charge to an area of lower charge like electrons will go from an area of higher negative charge to an area of lower negative charge because the electrons went from zinc to copper it was implied that zinc had more negative charge than copper did which meant that zinc metal ionized more than copper that means both were not even equal equilibriums and that's the part i want to talk about next is that what we realized was that zinc was more ions and charges than copper was because it's zinc's electrons that went to this and that's what we used to rate everybody's uh, reactivity the idea that who is ionizing more now we will repeat some of this again next time to solidify and then start solving because this chapter if if you really not focus in one class you're going to have a problem it's not like you can catch up again you have to stay focused on every class here so i'm going to leave this here but i'm going to ask you guys if you have any questions as to what we've done so far and what we've done is we've managed to isolate the redox reaction into two half equation half cells and passing current and the half cells have their own equilibrium which once connected takes a side and the electrons go from the elect uh, half cell that had more negative charge to the half cell that has less negative charge obviously when this start happening this starts increasing a negative charge and this starts decreasing a negative charge but we'll talk about that next class any questions for what i've explained so sir they both with their own equilibrium but then when they connected you see that the zinc equilibrium has a more negative charge yes so they actually the idea is the equilibrium was already achieved before they are connected once you connect them they can no longer be in equilibrium because once you connect them the electrons will go from an area of higher charge to an area of lower charge which means when you reduce this 
what happens to the disequilibrium? If you reduce this, according to Lay-Chartley's principle, what happens to this equilibrium? It'll go left. And if the electrons go here, you increase them here. So what happens to this equilibrium? It goes right. So in fact, the two equilibriums now take a side. This starts going left and this starts going right, which is the half equation for this half cell and that's the half equation of the half cell. Does that make sense? Sir, and this ends when either the zinc runs out or the copper sulfate solution runs out. Yes. But we're never going to worry about running out. But that's the real world problem, yes. The real world problem will be some of them will run out someday and then you have no more cell. That's literally what happens with batteries that you guys use. They run out of chemicals. The disposable batteries, that is. All right? Sorted? Sir, yes. So I got this can I please repeat what you said like in the last one minute. I uh, how about you go over the video once I reconnect? Okay, yeah, yeah that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Because I don't know which last minute you're talking about. This last minute was Asif's question, nothing else was talked about in the last minute. Like after Asif asked his question. Oh, after Asif asked his question, I was saying that that they're two they both are equilibrium. So they achieve equilibrium independently. The moment you connect the wire, you can no longer have an equilibrium because you've destroyed the equilibrium. Equilibrium only existed when they were individual half cells. The moment you connect the wire, since electrons go from zinc to copper, zinc's electrons are decreasing, which means, according to Le Chardin's principle, this equilibrium will have to shift left to make more electrons. And here, electrons are increasing. So copper has to gain electrons, which means that this equilibrium will shift to the right. So the moment you connect, the equilibriums take a side. So they're no longer reversible, they only have one side. Like copper goes forward only and zinc goes backward only. And now you have reduction and you have oxidation. Hence you have redox. But we'll do this part again to continue this to further ideas of this. But I'm going to wrap this up here. So yeah.